السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله if the brothers from the back room can move to the front room إن شاء الله then we'll get started so tonight will be our tenth lecture on أصول السنة and إن شاء الله after tonight I'll probably need two, maximum three more, so we'll be able to finish uh, probably two weeks before Ramadan or a week before Ramadan, so alhamdulillah, no problem. Uh, you know, we're on schedule, inshallah. All right, so again, uh, the young brothers, old brothers from the back, inshallah, move to the front. All right, so last week we had stopped, we were... Uh, discussing the aspect of aqidah related to uh, obedience to the rulers, uh, whether they be righteous or fajir, meaning uh, sinful. And inshallah ta'ala, tonight will be a continuation. We'll cover a few more points related to this important aspect of our aqidah. And as I had mentioned uh, last week, that this is much more relevant in our generation than before. SubhanAllah, because of the fitna, the fitan, the various types of trials and tribulations that we uh, see. So then Imam Ahmed, he continues after mentioning that um, we have to obey the Khalifa, whether he seized control by force or whatever may be the case, uh, we have to obey the ruler. Then the next point is, وَالْغَزُوا مَعْضٍ مَعَ الْأَمِيرِ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ الْبِرِّ وَالْفَاجِرِ لَا يُتْرَكْ Likewise, participating in battles along with the rulers is binding upon the believers until the day of judgment, whether the leaders be righteous or wicked, and it is not to be abandoned. So the leader of the nation if he calls for battles, because that's the only one who's allowed uh, to call for war, the leader of the nation. Random people can't just say, get up and start saying, okay, we wage war on such and such place. The leader of the nation is done in an organized manner. For any reason the leader of the nation calls for it, then you have to follow the leader and, and be part of the army if you're called upon. Now, of course, uh, we translate this as jihad, but a reminder before continuing that jihad coming from zuhud, which means to struggle, right? And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in a hadith that al mujahidu man jahada li nafsihi. The mujahid is the one who makes jihad against his own nafs, meaning he fights against his own desires. That's a mujahid. Jihad, the word jihad has 13 different connotations. One of them is the battlefield, right? So there's 12 other connotations to the word jihad. So don't get confused, especially with all sorts of extremists that are widespread in our generation. So one of those connotations is jihad, the battle, uh, waging war in the battlefield. And jihad in Islam is of two types. The defensive jihad, where non-Muslims are attacking you and you have to defend yourself and the offensive jihad, this is the second type. And what is meant here from the statement of Imam Ahmed that you have to participate in the jihad, uh, follow the ruler of your nation, so the president, prime minister, king, whatever may be the case, whoever is the Amir over the country, over the group of Muslims, you follow your leader and do not break away from it, right? So this is referring to the offensive jihad. So if a Muslim country has waged war for some reason, then you follow your ruler. You don't break away from it, uh, break away from him. As for the defensive jihad, this is, so the offensive jihad, uh, well, let me backtrack. I think a few weeks ago I had mentioned Fard, which means an obligation, something that is obligatory, fard. Fard is of two kinds. Fard al-ayn, every single Muslim, man or woman, is obligated to do something. That's called fard ayn. 
Fard kifaya is a communal fard. Let's say, for example, somebody passed away, right? Somebody died. Every single person from Masjid Taqwa does not have to come for Salatul Janazah. Because it's Fard kifaya. As long as some people from this community praise the Janazah, we are all, Alhamdulillah, not accountable. That's Fard al kifaya communal Fard. Fard al ain is an individual obligation. Every man, woman is responsible for praying Salat al-Maghrib and Isha and Fajr and Dhuhr and Asr. Other people cannot pray on his behalf, right? So the offensive jihad is Fard al-Kifaya. As long as some people are part of the army in any country, even you look at these Western lands, every single person is not part of the American army. But when the government calls for a draft, you answer the call. You obey your ruler and you follow the guidance in that organized manner. Right? The whole world follows this. Islam is no different. But, of course, the wars in Islam is based on Allah's commands, not personal whims and desires. What do the Western world do? Oh, that person has oil? Let's go kill, wage war in that country and steal their oil. Right? This is haram in Islam. No Muslim is allowed to wage war on another country. No Muslim ruler is allowed to wage war on another country just because he likes the land or he likes what's there or he likes the people or he wants to kidnap the women. All of this is haram in Islam. Right? So even when it comes to offensive jihad, the war, we don't break away from our ruler. Whether the Amir he be uh, al birri wal Faji, la yutrak. It doesn't matter if he's a righteous or a Fajr, a corrupt leader, but he is the leader of the Muslim nation. So we follow and we don't break away from that army. Then the next statement that Imam Ahmed brings The division of the war booty. That waqismatul fayt, which is the war booty that's collected in, uh, after the war, and the establishment of al hudud, which is the prescribed punishments of Allah subhanahu wa taala, it is the responsibility of the rulers, and this is continuous. No one is allowed to take this responsibility. So let's say there was a war, the war is finished, the ruler of the Muslims. The president, prime minister, king, okay, whatever uh, is in English we have. But the Amir of the Muslims, he is the one in re responsible or in charge of dividing the war booty. Also, he is the one in charge of carrying out or assigning people for the hudud, which is the legal punishments or capital punishments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained. No one else is allowed to do this, only the ruler or elected officials by, or selected officials by the ruler is responsible for these tasks. Then the next statement, لَيْسَ لِأَحَدٍ أَنْ يَطْعَنَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يُنَازِعُهُمْ It is not allowed for anyone, any Muslim, to curse the ruler or dispute with them in, in a public sense. Because someone will think, and that's why I said that these aspects of Aqidah are extremely important in our days today. And I mentioned this last week. If you tell a Muslim, brother, you can talk as long as you want about anything you want. The only thing majority of the Muslims will talk about today is the ruler. Regardless of what country he's from. He's going to curse his prime minister, curse his president, curse the king. He'll go on nonstop. But this is an aqidah aspect of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That we do not publicly go around cursing the rulers or disputing against them. Because this causes fitna. Only the blind person will deny this. When you start going in the streets and start cursing Fulan, he's the Amir of such and such country. What exactly are you achieving? You're going to sway the hearts of some people. They'll become like bandits, little groups, and then you make another political party, and you cause a separation between the Muslims. This is what you are achieving. 
You are the one causing division among Muslims. But when there is a unity, when all the Muslims are together in a jama'ah, there is peace, there is security, there is no infighting. Like subhanAllah, you look at every single Muslim country that has these systems. Think of anybody in the Asian countries, African countries, whatever may be the case. You have Muslims, they're from the same nation. They are divided into different political parties. Each person is willing to die for the man or woman who's the head of his political party. This is how blind people have become. But this goes against Islam. We don't go willing to sacrifice our life for any human being except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't do this. That people are fighting among each other. This person is a, a supporter of this group or that political group and they're fighting with each other. But you look at the whole world, we have non-Muslims coming into our masjids, shooting people up and killing us. This is the reality of the world. But Muslims, because of misunderstanding politics, they're killing one another. Even though we already have non-Muslims killing us. That where is our priority? Because people have forgotten this important aspect of Aqidah. Right? That they go around cursing and disputing with the leaders publicly. And this is, as I mentioned again, because a lot of people, a lot of people, they may say that, you know, uh, they'll know grave worshipping is shirk, going to a pier is shirk, doing the maulid is bid'ah. They know all of these things. Okay, then follow the aqidah all the way. No, politics, you see, I have to follow my own opinions now. You do not have the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You belong to a different group. Aqidah is one portion. It's a whole package. It's an entire package. Iman can't be divided that you pick and choose. This part of Iman I'll believe, I follow, it's easy. That aspect of Iman I'm going to reject. It doesn't work this way. So this is an extremely important aspect of our Aqidah that many Muslims unfortunately have misunderstood and their emotions have led them astray. And then the next point, وَدَفْعُ الصَّدَقَاتِ إِلَيْهِمْ جَائِزَةٌ نَافِذَةٌ And the sadaqah is to be given to them, and this is permissible and it is binding. مَنْ دَفْعَهَا إِلَيْهِمْ أَجْزَأَتْ عَنْهُ بَرًّا كَانَ أَوْ فَاجِرًا He who gives it to them has fulfilled his obligation whether they are righteous or wicked. The word sadaqah here is referring to zakat. Again from the sharia, from Islamic law, the ruler of the country is in charge of collecting zakat. He, have, uh, he appoints officials to go to different regions to bring the zakat to Baytul Mal. So someone can't say, well, I don't like my prime minister. I'm not going to give the zakat to Baytul Mal. You can't do this. Zakat is a pillar of Islam. You have to fulfill your pillar, whether you like their leader or not. So you give the zakat, the zakat is taken to Baytul Mal, and inshallah ta'ala, hopefully, it is distributed properly. So there's a system. The Amir is in charge, and he and his appointed officials go around region to region, collecting the zakat, and then keep bringing it to Baytul Mal, which is the treasury, the treasury uh, for the Muslim nation. So you have to give the zakat. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith that's collected in Sahih Muslim that عليهم ما حملوا وعليكم ما حملتم They are responsible for what they are responsible for. You are responsible for what you are responsible for. Your obligation, Allah has told us, we have to give the zakat if we meet that ability. The leader's job, responsibility, is to distribute it properly. That's on him. My job I have to fulfill, which is to give the zakat. Every single person has an obligation towards Allah. So you fulfill your obligations according to that, and leave the other person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you have to fulfill your duty, right? So it's done in a systematic uh, manner. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask each individual concerning what he has done. And no one will be questioned about another person's 
uh, wrong deeds, right? Then uh, the next point was Salatul Jumu'ati Khalfahu wa Khalfa Man Wallahu and praying the Jumu'ah behind that Amir or anyone appointed by the Amir Ja'izatun Baqiyatun Tammatun Raka'atayn It is permissible, it is sound, it is complete and Raka'atayn, we know that Salatul Jumu'ah is two units of prayer Man a'adahuma fahuwa muqtadi'un tarikun lil athar mukhalifun lil sunnah the one who repeats his salah thinking that my leader is a corrupt leader i have to repeat my prayer prayer behind him is not valid so the one who goes repeating his salah because he does not like his leader he is a muqtadi he has introduced bid'ah and mukhalif mukhalifun lil sunnah and he has differed from the sunnah Right? This is not something that is allowed. The Amir has left the Salah, you pray behind the Amir. Whether he is somebody who is righteous or a fajr or a corrupt. You did your obligation. You followed your Imam, followed your Amir. لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ فَضْلِ الْجُمْعَةِ شَيْءٍ There is no reward for this person if he thinks that he has to repeat Salatul Jumu'ah or any Salah, Salatul Jumu'ah thinking that he has to repeat. There's no extra reward. Rather, he's earning a sin because he is doing a bid'ah. And he has gone against the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. So, if he does not see the prayer behind the imams, whether they are righteous or wicked, to be correct. So, if the person sees or he thinks that praying behind the Amir that I don't like, whether he's good or bad, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter what he sees it as. The obligation is that you pray behind your Amir or the one that the Amir has appointed as the Imam. Fasunna, uh, and in the Sunnah it is mentioned, bi an yusalliya ma'ahum raka'atayn. The Prophet ﷺ has mentioned in his Sunnah, in an authentic hadith, that the one who prays the two rak'ah with, uh, with the Amir, then he has worshipped Allah and he has fulfilled his uh, duties of salah and iman. لا يكون في صدرك من ذلك شك And the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned that in his heart he cannot have any doubt whatsoever about that salah. He can't be thinking, oh the leader is bad, I don't know if my salah got accepted or not. You cannot have any shak in your heart. So you have to be fully confident that this is the salah that I have to do, whether I like my ruler or not, my salah is accepted insha'Allah ta'ala, no problem. So the prayer is the greatest pillar of Islam. And we already discussed this. And this is the most important action after taking the shahada for someone. And because of this great status, it is extremely, extremely important that the Muslims stay united behind their Imam. And I'm using the word Imam synonymously with the word Amir because we discussed this last week, that the word Imam just doesn't mean someone who leads you in prayer. The Imam is the leader of the Muslims. That's what the word means. So Imam slash Amir. So this is an obligation that you stay united, right? Like even... Let's forget the nation because we're not political bodies, it doesn't apply. Let's approach this in a way that it applies to us as a Muslim community living in the Western world. Let's say, you know, someone doesn't like me and there are people who don't like me. That's not a problem, alhamdulillah, right? And they say, okay, this guy's the imam, we're not going to pray behind him. We'll form another jama'ah in the masjid after he's done leading the people. This is going to destroy the community. This is common sense. Whether you like the Imam or not, you pray behind him. Because it bring, keeps the peace in the Muslim community. It keeps the body, the whole community united. So the same thing. If this is true for just a simple masjid, this is more important for an entire country of Muslims. That if you start separating away, then you form little groups, little pockets of politicians and leaders and this and that, and then you see the Muslims fighting and killing among each other, and which is exactly what's happening in the various countries today. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in the Qur'an, يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O my slaves who believe, إِنَّ أَرْضِي وَاسِعَةٌ فَإِيَّايَا فَاعْبُدُونِي The earth, I have made it spacious. It's big. There's no, uh, you know, scarcity. You, you have enough space. So worship me alone. Don't worry about it, right? So uh, now Imam Ahmed, he specifically used the word Salatul Jumu'ah because this is the best day of the week. This is the most important gathering every single week. The Muslims are obligated to gather behind the Imam, behind the Im Amir. Uh, for the regular salawat, people don't gather in this manner. But Jumu'ah, we all know. So this is why he specifically brought the big weekly event. And then of course it applies to the smaller events as well. So Jumu'ah, this is the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam. Jumu'ah is also the day Allah will order for the day of judgment to occur. So all of these are mentioned in authentic hadith regarding Friday, Yawmul Jumu'ah. So Jumu'ah prayer is obligatory as the two units, Raka'atayn as we know, along with the khutbah that we are obligated to listen to. We're supposed to come early, listen, because that's also another thing. Somebody may say, I don't like this Amir slash Imam. I don't want to listen to what he has to say. You have missed your Jumu'ah. You can't intentionally just delay and just show up before the Salah starts. Jumu'ah means the khutbah plus the Salah. So if you come late, you missed it. As the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari mentions, that the angels, they stand at the door. We don't see them, but they're there at, at every single masjid. They write down the names of the people who attend Jumu'ah. The moment the khatib gets on the minbar and he gives the salam, the angels roll their books and they stop writing the names. So anyone who comes after that, the angels have not recorded that they were present. Right? So uh, this is very important that you want to make sure you come on time for Jumu'ahs in order to have your name in that list that the people who uh, prayed Jumu'ah that week. But regardless, if someone says, I don't like the Amir, I'm not, I don't want to listen to what he has to say. You lose, you are the loser. You have earned the sin. You intentionally showed up late to Jumu'ah and you will not get the reward for Jumu'ah, right? The full reward. So this is not the way that uh, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'in, they were very careful, they were very cautious. And, uh, and they used to say that this is the deception from shaitan. The one who starts thinking this way, you are gonna become a loser. The one who separates away from the jama'ah, that you will be guilty of leaving the, Mus the general body of the Muslims. So you stay united for the greater good, right? As we mentioned, Islam focuses on the goodness of the entire community, not just one or two people, regardless of what their status is, how wealthy they are, it doesn't matter. What is good for the entire community, that is what is an obligation, right? We don't, we're not selfish people, rather being selfish is haram, right? We have to look at everybody Everybody's benefit. Everybody's benefit. Sometimes good people have to take a sacrifice, right? We know certain times, and it happens. Every day we see it happening, right? Even though maybe the awam may not know, but these type of things happen in every community, every nation. Many times good people have to sacrifice certain things, so just so that the entire community can, inshallah ta'ala, be at peace, right? But of course, the only limit is that we do not sacrifice the religion in order to bring that peace. Because that's a fake peace, rather it brings the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You sacrifice your own personal needs, personal benefits, no problem. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. But the benefit of the religion can, cannot be sacrificed. So anyway, so Imam Ahmed, he brings this principle and he makes it very clear that this is another principle of aqidah that is ijma'a, consensus. Every single alim before him has agreed upon this fact, whoever was from Ahlul Sunnah, right? And again, remember Imam Ahmed was the fourth one from the four a'imma. Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahumullah, they were all before him. So he wrote this book explaining that this is the aqidah of me and those who came before me and this is the aqidah of anyone who follows Tawheed and Sunnah, right? So this is not something that new that he came up with. Rather, he just 
brought everything in a book form to make it easier for the people that this is what everybody has been believing in since the beginning, starting with Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, uh, in, in terms of repeating the prayer or missing the khutbah, all of that this is from shaitan. Come, attend, be part of the community. Don't separate away that I don't like such and such and this and that, right? Because this is what a lot of people, and again, let's use the simple uh, example. If you see that there's trouble in the masjid and the good people are like, no, there's troublemakers, the bad people are doing this, there's yelling, screaming, fighting, I'm not going to show up. So when all the good people stop showing up, who's left? Only the fitna makers. Then you have no one to blame but yourself. So this is, it's an obligation. Muslims can't just retreat. When you see trouble, you can't retreat. Rather, the good people, everybody, we stick to the main body. You force, with Allah's help, the goodness to prevail. But if the good people just throw in the white flag and retreat, then, well, you can't complain after that. You had the opportunity, Allah opened the doors for you, but you retreated. Right? So the Sahaba, they never did this. You cannot sacrifice your religion. You have to focus on the greater good of the community. Stick as one body of Muslims uh, with the hold on to uh, the Book of Allah and the authentic Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? That's the criteria. Then also, uh, the next point, وَمَنْ خَرَجَ عَلَىٰ إِمَامٍ مِنْ أَئِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَقَدْ كَانَ النَّاسُ اجْتَمَعُوا عَلَيْهِ وَأَقَرُّوا لَهُ بِالْخِلَافَةِ The one who rebels, right? Kharaj. Kharaj means to exit. Those who rebel against the leaders. That's why the Khawarij are known as the Khawarij. Because they rebelled against Uthman radiallahu anhu. Right? That was the group. They make khuruj. That they rise up against the legitimate government. So the one who rebels against the ruler from among the rulers that the Muslim, of the Muslims while the people, the entire Muslim community has accepted so-and-so as the ruler. No one is allowed to rebel against that person. So the one who does this, by whatever uh, reason, w w whether the uh, Khalifa has بِأَيِّ وَجْهِ وَجْهٍ كَانْ أَوْ بِالْغَلَبَ It doesn't matter if that Khalifa came by the acceptance of the people, or he was someone who forced himself upon the people, but eventually became the Khalifa, it doesn't matter. He is the legitimate Khalifa. You cannot make khuruj against that Khalifa, that leader, while the Muslims are united behind him. And then of course, the one who rebels, he has caused the division among the Muslims. He's the one who is guilty of causing division amongst the Muslims. Uh, and he has gone against the narrations of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said in the hadith, فَإِن مَاتَ الْخَارِجُ عَلَيْهِ مَاتَ مِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَّةً The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever dies, while making khuruj, he has died the death of Jahiliyyah, as if he never became Muslim. Jahiliyyah is the period before Jibreel salam came to the Prophet wasallam. Before the whole generation or the period of time before the nubuwa of Muhammad wasallam is known as Jahiliyyah. People were ignorant; they didn't know Allah, they didn't know the truth. So the Prophet wasallam said here in this hadith in Sahih Muslim and others. That the one who dies after having made khuruj, he did not make tawbah and he did not give that path up, then he dies the death of jahiliyyah. So it's a major sin, major sin. It's not a small sin, right? It's a major, major sin to be rebelling against the ruler and causing fitna and division among the Muslims. وَلَا يَحِلُّ قِتَالُ السُّلْطَانِ وَلَا خُرُوجُ عَلَيْهِ لِأَحَدٍ مِنَ النَّاسِ and it is not permissible, it is not halal to fight the ruler or for anyone from the people to rebel, to make khuruj against him. فَمَنْ فَعَلَ ذَلِكَ فَهُوَ مُبْتَدِعٌ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِ السُنَّةِ وَالطَّرِيقِ And whoever makes khuruj or fights against the ruler, 
then he is a mubtadi, he is a deviant, he is a person of bid'ah. Ala uh, ghayri sunnati wa tariq. He is against the sunnah and the path of Islam. Right. So again, very, uh, very important points. Now the rulers. It is important for us to understand all rulers in any time, any place, they fall under four categories according to Islam. Number one, the Imam Adil, as the Prophet said. The Amir, who is a good Muslim, he fears Allah and he carries the justice of Islam. This is obviously the best option, right? This is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the number one choice. The second category of rulers is the oppressive, the zalim Muslim ruler. He's Muslim, but you know, he has whims and desires, he's power hungry, he has, you know, power has corrupted him, he oppresses people every now and then, but he's still a Muslim. He prays, fast, all these other basic Islam, Islamic duties, we can see that he does that. But it's just that he is a zalim. Right? He does dhulm on people in different ways. The third type of ruler is the kafir ruler, but he has adala. He is just. He's kafir, but he is very just and honest. Which was Najashi. He was a Christian, but he was just. And this is when the first hijrah took place, right? The Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba uh, while he was in Mecca, go to Habasha, Ethiopia. The ruler is just, even though he was a kafir, but he was an honest, just ruler. Then the fourth and the lowest one, the worst kind, is the kafir who is also a dhanim. Right? So every leader throughout history, until today and until the day of judgment, in any country, are one of these four categories. Right? This is what Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have stated. So every ruler that you can think of, president, king, prime minister, whatever may be the case, is going to be in one of these four categories. So as for the first, which is the Muslim, God-fearing and just, this is the absolute best choice for everyone, right? And they are very few, very few. After the Sahaba, after the Khulafa al Rashidun, until now, you can count them with one hand, right? So they are very few. And there is absolutely no ikhtilaf whatsoever that it is haram to rebel against such a ruler. Absolutely no ikhtilaf, right? Rather, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said that when there is a khalifa, there is peace, there is justice, and someone comes up wanting to be the khalifa, this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said that man has to be executed because he is trying to corrupt and break the unity and the peace of Islam, right? So the Amir has to execute that person. Then the second one, which is the Zalim Muslim ruler. For this person, as well as the, uh, the Aqeed of Ahlul Sunnah is, that you do not make khuruj against such a ruler because what follows will be greater fitna. Right now people are being oppressed, we understand. But if you try to rebel against him, there will be a lot more dhul, a lot more dhul. And the biggest example are the Sahaba themselves, right? I had briefly mentioned this last week. When Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, he was the governor of Iraq, there were, and he even was responsible, directly responsible for killing uh, the companions. For example, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, one of the elite and relatives of the Prophet ﷺ. However, the other companions, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, ibn Abbas, and others who are alive, they did not convince or tell anyone, let's go make khuruj. He's a zalim. He is killing the companions of Rasulullah. Not just any companions, the relatives of the Prophet ﷺ. What would happen today? If a leader of a Muslim country, let's say there were uh, relatives of the Prophet ﷺ, and that guy publicly executed one of the relatives, every single person will be up in arms against this leader. But look at the companions. They had sabr. Rather, people were asking them, 
asking Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that why aren't you doing anything? You guys are the companions and he's killing the relatives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He and they replied to him that this goes against the hadith and that they, they narrated that do not raise the sword against your leader even if they're whipping your back stealing your land stealing your wealth because what will come about will be far worse be patient let it be right so we have to follow somebody may say well we can't have sabr but we have the best example we give a simple reply brother we are not going to be better muslims than the sahaba if they could be patient with someone who was killing them then who are you and me the blood of abdullah ibn zubayr is far more valuable than any one of our bloods we have to admit this he's one of the sahaba and he's a relative of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right we all know the status of ahlul bayt and 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 the companions in general so they were patient we have to be patient too if allah forbid that we have a zalim ruler they used to make dua they prayed in salah in jamaa and made dua that may allah guide the rulers right may allah remove the hatred or that that toughness and this zulm that exists replace it with love and just justice so those are the duas that we have to make as well and there are many many narrations regarding the time of the sahaba under that period of time during that period of time when hajjaj was uh, the ruler also when uh, imam al hasan al basri rahimahullah people approached him they saw okay the living sahaba they're not doing anything let's go to imam al hasan al basri he's from iraq this that he's one of the biggest scholars of that generation let's see can we rebel this that and he shut them down as well that uh, this is not the way rather go ask your rights to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask allah for help because if you rebel you're going to bring more harm more harm and then as for the disbelieving ruler we said that there are two types the disbelieving ruler who is just and the disbelieving ruler who is also a zalim when it comes to disbelievers this is specifically referring to a muslim nation that has been taken over by disbelievers then it is an obligation upon the muslims to end that occupation which we we all know let's say when the british came over they're kuffar and they were the worst of people dividing the muslim lands conquering the muslim lands uh, governing over us they forcefully became our government so, throughout the world right the british the french different people different parts they divided everybody so that's something different that the muslims if they have the ability they are able to do so but even then they have to think will toppling them be an easy minimum death minimum violence if so then okay let's make a unified effort but if that effort is going to bring about the bloodshed of more and more muslims then the ulama will say that be patient wait for that opportunity to remove the disbelieving occupation right you have to wait for the time that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you don't want to let's say okay they you know we they're kuffar they took over our country they became our president let's just rise against them and then you see the next morning a million muslims are dead in that situation you be patient that there has to be a chance from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that opportunity has to come right so even in that situation subhanallah the muslims have been commanded that you be patient use your wisdom and take the necessary steps without causing more damage to the ummah than already what has happened but the point is that if the kuffar have taken over your country and become rulers over you then of course the which is clearly from islam that you are allowed to uh, make the attempt of removal provided that these few conditions are met but when it comes to the muslim even if he be a zalim there is no ikhtilaf among the scholars of ahlus sunnah that you cannot make khuruj against them that is completely haram and goes against the aqidah 
Uh, and then uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in another hadith that's collected in Bukhari and Muslim, it's a muttafaqun alayh, which is the highest grade of authenticity. In that hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Man hamala alayna silaha falaysa minna. Whoever raises the weapon against us is not from us. So as a Muslim, you cannot raise your sword or your guns against another Muslim. This completely goes against Islam. So this is the emphasis that let's say the Muslim government, no doubt he's going to have police, a military, this, that. Not everybody's the same. There are so many Muslim soldiers who have fear of Allah. They have justice. Now if you say, okay, I don't like this president. He's a dhalim, let's rebel against. Now you're raising your arms against the other Muslims too that are on his side. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ made it very clear. And it's a muttafaqun alayh. The highest level of authenticity. No way can you doubt this. That anyone who raises the weapons against us, whether he be Muslim or not, is not from us. Right? So we cannot bring about, viol we cannot bring about change through violence and corruption. Right? This is, evil cannot be removed by greater evil. Uh, and then also we have to remember, as Allah mentioned, in Allah la yughayiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim, that Allah will never change the condition of a people until they first change what is in themselves. And this goes in both meanings. If you are already good, Allah will not give you bad until bad has entered in your heart and you yourself turn bad. Now Allah brings about bad. And if you're bad, Allah is not going to bring about khair until you change yourself first. So it goes both ways. So Allah makes it very clear. And we, I gave this example, I think it was last week at the Jummah. Like let's say when Clinton, uh, you know, committed zina, he has his mistress. 75% of American married men have mistresses. They have extramarital affairs. Clinton was just one of the 75%. Like it shouldn't be surprising. So when we see our Muslim rulers stealing from us, not giving justice, this, that, truth be told, most of the Muslims today are exactly like that. Any chance they get, they'll steal money from somebody else. They'll cheat another Muslim, right? Or cheat another human being. They'll oppress another human being. People oppress their own wife and children. So how can we complain against the ruler? So we have to think, that their leader is from us, right? There's a hundred million Muslims in a country, that leader is one of those hundred million. So it's check who or what type of people the hundred million are, then you'll see how the leader is too. Simple uh, explanation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't get emotional and we don't start trouble and rebel and this and that, which is what has doomed the ummah today. That there are Muslim groups which motives, whose motives are just politics, but they hide behind the screen of Islam and brainwash people and stir up trouble, right? And those type of groups, uh, those Muslim groups who politicize Islam, they're in every country, different, in different countries, they have different names, but the concept is the same, that they have a political Islam version, right? Version that's called political Islam. And then they go radicalize people and rebel and this and that. And they're never found. They don't cause any peace or bring about any peace. They just bring up, they're always angry, causing more stress, bringing more trouble. And many of the youth leave Islam. They turn away when they see these people because that's what they think Islam is. But the reality is this is completely against the Sunnah. This goes against the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah. Then the last point that we will discuss for tonight uh, let me just, instead of reading the Arabic, so I'll save some time. But anyways, uh, the next point is that when it comes to fighting, that وَقِتَالُ النُّسُوسِ وَالْخَوَارِجُ جَائِزٌ إِذَا عَرَضُوا لِلرَّجُلِ فِي نَفْسِهِ وَمَالِهِ Fighting the lusus, meaning robbers, criminals, and fighting the khawarij. So the Muslims are being robbed, these are robbers, they are khawarij. Fighting them is jaiz. And it, as long as it, like, إِذَا عَرَضُوا لِلرَّجُلِ فِي نَفْسِهِ وَمَالِهِ With regards to his own self, 
and his wealth. So if someone is protecting himself, defending his life, defend, defending his property, then of course you fight that person who has come to invade you uh, or steal from you and so on and so forth. Then also it is permissible for him to fight in order to defend himself and his property and he may defend it with everything he has at his disposal. But if they leave him, the attackers leave him or flee from him, then it is not permissible for him to pursue the criminal or chase after them. لَيْسَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا الْإِمَامَ أَوْ وُلَاتَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ That is not allowed for anyone except the Imam of the Muslims. Example, let's clarify this. Allah forbid you're sitting at your home. A robber barges in. It does not matter if his name is Muhammad or Rodriguez. Right? It doesn't matter what his name is. He has barged into your house. He's about to kill you, your wife or children, steal from you, whatever it is. It is fard upon you as a Muslim to fight this attacker. To save yourself, to save your children, to save your family. Now let's suppose you punched him, threw things at him. He fled. You are not allowed to chase after him. Rather you call the police. Give the description, the authority chases him. Right? So this is, we have to, like, you know how they have the law... You don't take the law in your own hands. This is actually from Sharia. No one is allowed to take the law in their own hands. You go complain to the authorities, the authority then carries out what they have to do. You do as much as you have to. Beyond that point, it is the Imam, the government's responsibility. Then the next point, uh, he may also defend himself. He may only defend himself at that present time. And he should not intend to struggle. وَيَنْوِيَ بِجُهْدِهِ أَنْ لَا يَقْتُلَ أَحَدًا He cannot have the niyyah to kill this person. It's just fighting and warding him off. Right? The moment someone barges into your home, you don't immediately say, I'm going to kill him. This is haram as a Muslim to do. Kill him in whatever way I can. Right? So your intention cannot be that I have to kill him. That's haram. Just because someone is transgressing against you doesn't mean you transgress against him. Right? So you have to remember this. However, فَإِنْ مَاتَ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ فِي دَفْعِهِ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ فِي الْمَعْرَكَةِ فَأَبْعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمَقْتُولَ If through the fighting, by accident, the criminal ended up being killed, Allah will remove that person from his rahmah. You have not sinned. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The key hadith here. Allah knows your intention. Now if you already have the intention, the moment you saw him enter your house, you want to kill him, you can't hide that from Allah. But your intention is just to fight. Maybe you, I don't know, you had a lamp and you smashed his head just to stop him. He ended up dying. But your intention was just to smack him and stop him. No problem. This is not a sin. There is no accountability upon you. And he will pay for his sins for having transgressed against you and your property and your life on the day of judgment. So this is very extremely important. You don't have the intention to kill. You have to defend yourself and your family. You did something, threw something, maybe punched him in the wrong spot in the head or something happened. Or maybe you punched him, he fell down the stairs. Right? And he hit his head in an awkward way and he died. Whatever may be the case, that's not on you, inshallah ta'ala, no problem with that. Uh, because this is the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, who said that man qutila duna malihi fahuwa shaheed. This is the hadith in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari as well. That whoever uh, he who he is he whoever is killed while defending his wealth, and in the other narration, defending his property, he is a shaheed. Right? So you're fighting, and in the process you got killed, you're a shaheed. While fighting by accident, you killed him. He will be punished because he is the criminal. You will not be held accountable. And then moving on, if he, okay, and in all the narrations regarding this, a person is only commanded to fight them. In every single hadith that gives this same message, the Prophet ﷺ only speaks about fighting the aggressor. He never says, you kill the aggressor. This is from Islam, again from the justice of Islam. 
The government carries out the hudud, but you yourself, you only fight. And as for the government, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the ayah in Surah Ma'idah that إِنَّمَا جَزَاءُ الَّذِينَ يُحَارِبُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادًا The punishment for those who have waged war against Allah and His Messenger or those who spread mischief across the earth, what is their punishment? أَنْ يُقَتَّلُوا That they be executed. أَوْ يُصَلَّبُوا Or they be crucified. أَوْ تُقَطَّعَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلُهُمْ مِنْ خِلَافِ Or their limbs be cut off from the opposite sides. And number four, أَوْ يُنْفَوْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ Or they be banished from the land, meaning be put into prison. These are the four choices that the government has against any criminal who rapes, who steals, who's a hijacker, who's a robber, whatever may be the case. This is the ayah that talks about the legal punishments in Islam that the government carries out. So the Amir, the Qadi, the judge, or the Amir, the law of the land for the Muslims, these are the four choices Allah has given. And He has left it open. The Amir decides which one of the four He wants to carry out. Like for example, in, in, in let's say a few years back in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, a person, he got caught molesting children. So the Qadi, he did uh, the crucifixion, Yusallabu. In the streets of Riyadh, the person was crucified and it's written, this, this person had molested children, so this is his punishment. This is from Islam. Seeing that, every other person who wanted to molest, they'll stay quiet. Whoa, I don't want to be this. Right? And he is crucified and he dies until he bleeds out. Or in other situations, the Qadi, uh, I remember in Mecca, he cut off the limbs from the opposite sides. So the, the Qadi, the Amir, they have the choice. Allah has given them four choices. Right? And, uh, and the last one is, وَيُنْفَوْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ Which is to banish them from the earth. Umar radiallahu anhu was the first one who set up the prison system. No one in the whole world had the concept of prison before Umar radiallahu anhu. So he understood this, okay, banish them from the earth. Okay, they might go somewhere else, cause more fasad. We'll remove them from the community, which is what Allah says. We'll keep them in prison until they straighten up for a certain amount of time. So the judge determines what, how long, how many years, whatever may be the case, all right? So this is how it is. So it's an aspect of aqidah that you cannot carry out the hudud by yourself, right? Like uh, to explain before I get into questions, Allah forbid someone's child, someone's son or daughter committed zina. The father has no right to lash the son or the daughter hundred times. This is done by the government, right? So you have to remember this. Even as parents, Allah forbid if our children, your son stole, you can't go cut your son's hand off. This is haram on you. Rather, you call the police, arrest him. He goes to court and the judge does it, carries it out. So hudud, when it comes to legal punishments of any sort, absolutely no one but the amir or the appointed officials have the right to carry that out. We cannot be vigilantes. <laughs> right? So, all right, inshallah, we have 15 minutes. Uh, questions and sisters as usual. Yeah, yeah. So if you're being robbed, yeah. are you able, and you have a gun, are you able to um, point it at them and threaten to um, shoot Yeah, you, you are allowed. So let's suppose if someone has a gun in, in, in so, their house. I mean like if you have a gun. Are you yeah, yeah. To let's, the, let's say the owner of the house has a gun, right? And Allah forbid a robber came. The owner of the house can say, listen, I'm armed. I'm going to shoot you if you don't leave, right? And even when you shoot, the first gunshot should not be a shot in the head. <laughs> right? like right? If need be, you can fire warning shot, shoot at the door or wall or something. I'm not kidding. Shoot him at his legs or something like that, right? So your intention cannot be to kill, right? You, it cannot, even if somebody, Allah forbid, is robbing you uh, and comes. Uh, but if it's now, in a situation, let's say, since you gave this gun example, now let's suppose the robber himself has a gun, he's about to shoot you. Either he's going to shoot you and your family, or th that's, a, that's a different situation, right? By, but by default, you should not have any intention of killing a person. There's a hadith that Imam Ahmed collected in his Musnad. A woman came to the Prophet ﷺ. She was, you know, for her 
I was going to say grocery needs. <laughs> she went out from her house to get dates and things like that. <clears throat> By the Qadr of Allah, a man who was walking through the desert, you know, jumped on her and tried to rape her. So this woman, she's on, you know, it's the desert. She's on the ground fighting for her life, trying to save her Izzah. She was just trying to find and she found a rock. She took the rock and the man's on top of her, of course, so she smacked him. The rock hit the head and the man instantly died. So she came crying to the Prophet ﷺ that this is what has happened. And the Prophet ﷺ replied to her, Your attacker will be in Jahannam because he wanted to violate your chastity. You have no punishment from Allah. You had to save your honor. Right? But notice here, the woman's intention was not to kill him. He just, she just wanted to save her izzah. So she just took the rock, smashed his head. So this incident even happened. We have cleared the leaf from the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ that if accidentally your attacker is killed, there is no fault in Islam. Right? Praying is better than doing Qur'an. Is that true? Of course, praying is the pillar of Islam. Uh, you can't skip Salah uh, saying that I'm reading Qur'an. Right? So that's a pillar of Islam. Now, uh, maybe you're referring about, I don't know, extra salawat, right? Still, nothing will overtake the reward of salah. Like let's say you woke up in the last third of the night. You have two options. You can read Qur'an or you can pray tahajjud. The tahajjud will have more reward than reading the Qur'an. Or you can be like Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, who used to divide some parts for the salah, some parts for reading. So you get the best of both, inshallah. But salah is the highest, and nothing can overtake salah. In Jumu'ah, uh, in Jumu'ah, is it haram to talk? Uh, yes, because the khutbah is part of the salah. You cannot talk, as the, there's numerous ahadith. Numerous ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ has said that the one who talks in, in, during the khutbah, he has lost his uh, Jumu'ah. Once... Uh, uh, this was between Abu Darda and Ubay ibn Ka'ab. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the khutbah he was talking about Surah Al-Mulk. So one of them asked the other, "When did the surah get revealed?" Because he wasn't aware. He missed when Jibril came, so he was asking. This is a question he asked during the khutbah, and it was a completely fine. Not, "Hey, did you have what did you have for breakfast before coming to Jumu'ah?" Which is what people do nowadays. Literally, this is what they're asking during khutbah, right? Uh, anyways, or what do you want to eat for lunch after the khutbah? They were asking about the tafsir of the, I mean, the surah that the Prophet ﷺ was discussing in the khutbah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, you have lost today's Jumu'ah. Right? So even this type of conversation is not allowed during the khutbah. Right? And it's also another reason why the khutbah is not supposed to be one hour long. This contradicts the sunnah. Right? When I first came here, a lot of people said, Shaykh, why is your khutbah only 20-25 minutes? Because you're supposed to sit still. You're not supposed to talk. You're not supposed to look here and there. Uh, it'll be a dhul if, you want, if I made you do this for an hour. Even doing it for 20 minutes is, is a very difficult for many people. All right. Um, yeah. No, uh, uh, good question. Even when you went, and let's suppose for some reason you entered late. It is not allowed for you to give salam during the khutbah. You just quietly pray tahiyatul masjid if you're in a masjid. If you're not in a masjid, if you're in a center, musalla, some other building where they hold Juma, no need to pray tahiyatul masjid because tahiyatul masjid is only for masjid. You quickly pray your two and then you sit down. So no salam, nothing of this. If Allah wants to have, uh, okay, this is this no no problem. If Allah wants to have kids, can He? This is what in Surah Ikhlas Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has made very clear regarding Himself. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not have children, nor is He the child of anyone. Allah is Allah. Having parents, children, siblings, this is a human quality. This is a quality of animals. Animals give birth. Human beings give birth. It is. Uh, it contradicts the greatness and the perfection of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, to have this. Then you, God will cease to be God. 
Right? So Allah makes it very clear in Surah Ikhlas, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not have children, nor is he the child of anyone. Um, and also, the other part of this question, throughout the Qur'an, you will find, which is true, that Allah, uh, He does, يَفْعَلُ ma yurid. He only does whatever He wants. Allah does not want to have children. That's why He Himself has said, لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ Because this is not befitting of God Almighty, the Creator of the universe, to go through this process of childbirth and this and that. Right? This is for His creation. And Allah is completely different from His creation. Uh, yeah, so the next question is similar to that. So hopefully, yes. Oh, yeah, so if you're in a masjid and there's a shooter inside, and you're in the middle of Salah, do you, have, do you defend yourself or you do, or you continue Salah? Th that's again a different situation. If that's a situation that, of course, inshallah ta'ala, may no masjid ever be again. Uh, but of course, that's a situation where the person has to be taken down by any means necessary to prevent more bloodshed. Right, so he, he can be taken down, meaning shot at, whatever may be the case. So he has to continue salah? No, no, no. If that, Allah forbid, that happens, some people, of course, have to grab him and put him down. Oh, so yeah. you just have to Yeah, yeah, inshallah. Uh, any other question? Yes, brother. Yeah, uh, this, is the norm, uh, this is the norm Muslim country. Yeah. So a lot of Muslim people, uh, they go to uh, army, um, Navy and Air Force, yeah. and they fight to against the Muslim. This is the right. Yeah. Okay. So the brother is asking about, you know, us living in America or any other. You know, this would apply to any Muslim living in any non-Muslim country. Mm -hmm. And we find that Muslims maybe they jo uh, go join the army, mm -hmm. or whatever may be the case. You know, Air Force, Navy doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not something. If someone is able to do so, nobody has forced him. He has the freedom of choice. This is not something that he should do, right? Uh, because you're joining a non-Muslim army, most likely you're going to, and especially nowadays, most likely you're going to go to some Muslim country and kill Muslims, right? So this is not something that is uh, permissible, right? Uh, now, of course, if a non oh, you guys are not patriotic, this, that. No, we're patriotic enough. Your life your property, your wealth is safe from my hands and my tongue. What more do you want? Simple as that. I am not allowed to violate you in any way whatsoever. What more do you want? This is from Islam, right? So this is something that, uh, don't be shy. I remember when I was in college in Texas, this is when Bush just waged the war. So, you know, how they go around recruiting and they make these flowery statements. Listen, your college is going to be paid for this, that, whatever may be the case. You're going to, you know, you'll get your college degree while being there. You get to see the world. You defend your country, this, that. <laughs> so Alhamdulillah, I just said Bismillah and made a statement against him. I said, listen, I was born in Ukraine and I'm a Muslim. When I was known as Soviet, I'm a Muslim. You're calling me to join the American army? Answer that question for you, uh, for yourself. <laughs> he, started, <laughs> he was actually surprised that I was able to say that. So then it led to a different conversation that, so which one are you? Are you a communist or a Muslim? But alhamdulillah, it opened the door. We actually ended up talking for a whole hour about Islam. But like the point is, don't be afraid. And I was only 18 years old when I made that statement. <laughs> right? So don't be afraid. Uh, there's many open-minded people out there. You just have to explain to them, right? If you need to uh, break the ice with a couple of jokes here and there, just relax the situation, no problem. But it open up the conversation. Explain to them why that would be the case. Now, of course, there are many brothers, maybe they were in the army, they visited a Muslim country, they, ex they got the dawah and took their shahada while in the army. That's a different situation. Right, but if you have the option, uh, no, I'm not just gonna go join something where I have to go randomly kill without even knowing why I'm killing. Right, this goes against uh, the decency of a human being. Like you have the right, you have the right to think before taking an action. Right, so this is not an issue, inshallah. Uh, yeah. As you mentioned, that uh, if when the child committed zina, you are not allowed to punish them. 
uh, in this country, like you know, that what we, what would we what would we do? Like you know, you have to complain to the local authorities or what? Okay, so brother asked a good question. Uh, Allah forbid if your child commits zina living in these countries, you can't punish them. Uh, so let me uh, properly uh, clarify. You can punish them as, as a father and mother. You just cannot carry out the had punishment, right? Which is the legal capital punishment. So Allah forbid a single male or uh, never married, never been married before male or female, your son or daughter ends up committing zina, the had punishment is a hundred lashes. That you cannot do. This is only allowed for the Muslim government, all right? But as a father and mother, you have done a major sin. You have every right to punish your child. Allah forbid if they have done this. And you think of something like, let's say, okay, uh, you know. No TV for two hours. No, no, no. No TV for two hours is not a punishment, right? <laughs> right? Like some severe punishment because he or she needs to understand that this is one of the worst sins that you can commit. If there are no consequences, the person will never realize that what he or she has done is wrong and he or she will not make tawbah to Allah. So the goal of the parent is to do your level best to make sure that your son or daughter understands that what he has done is terrible. Make tawbah to Allah and do not repeat it. That's one. Second, generations when these teenagers or college kids, well they're not kids, you know, young adults, end up falling into zina, it's because the parents have not helped them get married. Right? So focus on that part too. That you punish them in a certain way to shake them, wake them up, make them fear Allah, but at the same time help them so they do not fall into this sin again. Right? So it's a, you have to tackle the problem in both ways. Right? right. Any other question? I have one, but I'm not sure. Okay, one second. If a robber broke into someone's house and the robber is going to kill... Okay, Ariane asked the same question, so I answered it. If you're in the army going to defend Muslim country, but you're going to have to kill people to defend your country, is this a sin? No, I mean, any time, as the hadith mentioned, uh, it does not matter whether you're in the army or not. Allah forbid you're a Muslim, you're in a Muslim land, Anyone has invaded your land, is confiscating your property, violating your life. The Muslim is obligated to defend himself and his family, right? This is for anyone and everyone, right? You don't just sit around and say, okay, you want to kill my family? You can do it, I'll be in the kitchen making you a nice pot of biryani too, right? No, you have to fight, right? And this is the law anywhere, even American law, British law. Allah forbid somebody barges into your house, it is completely legal for you to fight off that person. So Islam is no different. Uh, rather, Islam is a religion created by, uh, from Allah, and the laws are created by Allah. He knows what's good and just. So now, of course, if you're in the Muslim army, and you are defending Islam, defending your family, dis defending the Muslim land, and you're doing this sincerely, then of course this is the mujahid, uh, this is the greatest reward, right? The one who does it, follow the rules and guidelines of the Amir and so on and so forth. So these would be the two uh, situations. Right. One last question, maybe. Nothing? Or, oh, good. We keep getting louder and louder and make it difficult for some of our brothers to have a conversation. Oh, I, make, I'm, I get louder because they make it difficult on me to speak. <laughs> so that's why I have to get louder. Yeah, sometimes uh, in this community giving a lecture is also like a khutbah. I have to scream <laughs> because I have a lot of competitors from men and women. Alhamdulillah. All right, inshallah. So we'll give a dan and we'll pray, inshallah. No, you, you lead this along. Give somebody else the other. Hey, for team, can you just stop this? You just stop. Press stop.